this is Franklin Einsbruck. Well done. And you are, according to Wikipedia, uh, you are the producer of one of the longest running blogs about visual art. That's correct. And I ran across you in The Federalist, which is not exactly about art. <laughs> but your primary voice in the world is about the visual. That's right. I am mainly an art critic and a painter. And the writing at The Federalist is more specifically focused on politics, but really not exclusively. I don't have one of these backgrounds in politics like a lot of these guys who, you know, they've been thinking about politics since they were 12 and they majored in history in school. I'm not one of those people. I sort of came into this hmm. via dealing with problems of aesthetic philosophy, first of all, and then problems of free speech. And so when I'm in the Federalist, it's usually to talk about free speech. And oftentimes there is some kind of aesthetic component to that. One of my earlier pieces for them was about the Kimono Wednesday kerfuffle. Yeah. And so that had an art component to it. It had a free speech component. There was a political component to it. And this has sort of been going on for about 10 years now in some form or another. I kind of became political around 2007. The, uh, the atrocities that were going on in the Bush administration were deeply distressing to me in a way that politics had never really stressed me out before. Yeah, And I started to question, well, why why do I think this? Why do I feel this? And once I realized that I don't really fit into a left-right thing very well, it forced me to clarify for myself, well, mm. what exactly do I think and, and why? So, I, um, although I'm at the Federalist and I'm happy to be at the Federalist and I'm grateful that the Federalist will publish me, I'm in many respects a really lousy conservative. And, and this has been the ongoing feature of my writing life. I've never had the luxury of agreeing with the entire contents of any publication that has deigned to have me in the pages in the magazine. And that's as true of the hmm. Federalist as it is of Art in America. Yeah. I certainly don't endorse much of what goes on uh, at Art in America either, but, you know, I've appeared there and I'm well, what about they've, uh, they've had me on. What about Actual art and actual America. Do you, do you have a voice art, in that? Uh, first of all, I'm concerned about the quality of that audio just now. So if you want to try asking yeah. that again. I was asking about... Art and America. Actual art and actual America. And what's your position on that and your position in that? My position on art? Uh... <laughs> Can you be more specific? <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, well, I mean, you're. We were talking about you have a voice in the Federalist, mm -hmm. and and you don't necessarily fit in there. You don't necessarily fit in in the magazine Art in America. And I'm just wondering, in the broad, where do you place yourself in the broader movements? If there are movements anymore in art, maybe that's mm -hmm. just a retrospective historical outlook that doesn't really hold true anymore. Well, yeah. I mean. Yes and no. It's going to depend on who you ask about that. I'm one of the few people that I know in the art world who identifies as a modernist. And so this is very much in line with uh, Greenbergian modernism. The reason for that is largely because I had a mentor in graduate school named Walter Darby Bannard. And Darby was friends with Clement Greenberg. And I kind of implicitly absorbed that way of looking at art and that way became explicit as I started to write more and more about art and to me it seemed like a sensible way to go about the problem of looking art. Art is basically something that you react to and judge intuitively that it is resistant to intellectual programs and theoretical programs and the um, the assumption is that quality exists, that goodness in art exists, and one ought to be going about the problem of trying to make that manifest, make quality manifest. So that's uh, 
a wildly unpopular position to have in the art world. Yeah. That is uh, anti-theoretical in an art world that adores theory. Okay. And nevertheless, I'm very much of the mind that if you stick to that, the kinds of art that you like will be very varied. Like you'll, you'll like a lot of different kinds of things. You'll like fewer and fewer examples of each kind, but you will like more and more kinds. Huh, and that's sort of how taste ends up working if you're really operating out of your intuition. So I've had cause to write about all different kinds of art from traditional painting to relational aesthetic stuff. And, it's, and I have found things to like pretty much everywhere I look. I also find things not to like pretty much everywhere I look. So that's my take as an artist and art critic. Where I am politically, I actually identify, well, it depends on who I'm talking to. I'm willing to tell another libertarian that I'm a libertarian because they don't fill their diapers when they find out that you're not exactly on the same page as them. Huh. People who I don't think are libertarians, I usually tell them that I am a crypto anarchist. My feeling these days is that technology is making government obsolete. Hmm. Uh, that's a positive position rather than a normative one. I don't think this should be happening. I think this is happening. It is happening as we speak, and we are not going to be stopping it. The normative implication of that is that we ought to make it so that the transition from statehood to statelessness should be as peaceful and as comfortable for as many people as possible. I think uh, what's going to happen instead is that we're going to have a crisis, but I would prefer not to see a crisis. But you said uh, a translation from statehood to statelessness. Mm -hmm. You think that's inevitable? Yes. Yes, I think it is. I think there are a lot of ways it could happen. I think there are some scenarios that are basically apocalyptic that are on the table in regards to that happening. I also think that there's some possibilities that could be a peaceful and at least somewhat orderly transition, but I don't see states being around for a whole lot longer, historically speaking. Could you define what you mean by state then? Uh, a body politic, a system of laws? Mm -hmm. Body politics, system of laws, I think, are going to be replaced by private arrangements uh, that are focused around the individual and are going to be voluntary, at least to some extent. And there is going to be a resurgence of what we might call mores or natural law or something like that, in which people kind of agree to do things because that's how we do things, which is something that sort of lies beneath law. If we, if we didn't have that and we just tried to impose laws on top of it, it probably wouldn't be very successful. And the reason that the laws work is because we kind of all agree that it'd be better not to kill people if we can avoid that. And, you know, it'd be, it'd be good if we didn't just rip off each other's stuff and we tried to talk about things rather than immediately draw knives. You know, there's yeah. there are... There are presumptions in the culture that make law possible, and if uh, if you don't have that and you want laws, you better send out the army, because you're going to need a bunch of guys with guns to come out and say, uh, this is how we're doing things now. Uh, so, so I think even without laws that derive from the state, you're still going to have this kind of basis and culture that will allow people to operate and cooperate and generally avoid pulling guns on each other. Uh, but I'm not really sure that we're hmm. going to have a, whole, a longer future in which those mechanisms are, um, are state-enforced. And we may not need the state to do it, so... So you don't think that certain behaviors need a an enforcement or the threat of enforcement to keep people in line? I think there's going to be enforcement and threat of enforcement, but I think it's going to originate from a private source rather than a public source. Okay, so like a, the corporation that you buy into for safety or something like that. Exactly. And there are some people who have done really extensive work on this. Uh, one of them, interestingly, is David Friedman, uh, who is the son of Milton Friedman, who you've probably heard of. Mm -hmm. And he's done 
interesting analysis of what he calls, uh, or really what uh, what's generally returned turned to as uh, polycentric law. So, you know, you have your defense force, and somebody else has their defense force and you end up with a quarrel with that other somebody how do you go through the process of working that out because you don't necessarily like nobody wants to die right so how do the four of you between you and your representative and them and their representative get this resolved to some degree of satisfaction with uh, with maximum outcomes for everybody involved and that's an interesting game theory problem but yeah. it's also something that goes on in law like anytime you enter mediation instead of going to court to resolve the dispute, you are doing exactly that. So it's not like it's unprecedented and completely crazy. I think uh, it's a weakness in libertarianism, kind of a, an endemic weakness in libertarianism to have to deal with these weird hypotheticals. Mm -hmm. uh, that's hmm. not something you see liberals and conservatives really getting into quite as much. I think we're the kind of a philosophically minded uh, political group and as a consequence of that, we tend to entertain stuff that, it, you know, maybe we don't need to think about, and maybe this is like La La Land. Uh, Nick Gillespie, who uh, until Gillespie, excuse me, Nick Gillespie, who until recently was the managing editor at Reason, says that uh, we don't like to spend a lot of time talking about libertopia. Okay. You know, let's let's try to maybe decriminalize grass or you know stop getting kids arrested for putting up lemonade stands. Like let's go after stuff like that that hmm. we all can kind of agree on. It'd be better if that sort of thing wasn't going on. Uh, um, but nevertheless, I think there's an angle on it that by the time you get to the by, t by the time you get to where I am politically, you're dealing with a lot of hypotheticals, and there's hmm. not really a way around that. Yeah. Uh, do you do you think that we'll switch from statecraft to this uh, privatized statecraft um, because the private sector, or whatever this is, whatever this alternative to the state is, do you think we'll migrate there because it will be more efficient and effective and cheaper than the state because it sounds more complicated like if there's the law and we all know that there's a centralized law mm -hmm. then it, it just as a concept as a story that's in our head that's kind of always there that threat of violence from a source that has a monopoly on that if you take mm -hmm. that away and you replace it with something that's more of a system will that system survive because it's more effective, more efficient, or because it I doesn't have so. the problem. I, mean, I mean, you could you could ask yourself: Would you rather go into mediation or fight it out in a courtroom? I mean, you'd probably rather go for mediation. It's going to depend on what your issue is. But hmm. people avoid courtrooms because they are awful and produce really erratic results. Hmm. And. Uh, presents something of a danger to everybody involved, whether it's. Uh, it, usually financial danger. So yeah. we want to try to work things out without resorting to that. So there's an efficiency element to it. There is a, an ease of use element to it. Uh, there is a safety element to it because, you know, we could all go away with everybody unhappy and uh, having spent a bunch of money on lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. And there are also scenarios in which we have a currency crisis, for instance, and now all the laws are in place, but nobody can afford to enforce them. And so what happens instead? I, okay. I sincerely hope that that doesn't happen. I'm, I am yeah. not rooting for Ragnarok. I think it would be better if we could just make a transition to something that was more voluntary and more private. But I don't. But, but it's going to be something like that. At the point that you don't need your government for money, like there's cryptocurrency now, so you could have, have that, that instead of uh, the state-issued money. If you don't need it for contracts, because you can do that sort of thing through the Ethereum protocol, it's, hmm. it's sort of... Um, you would look at it as kind of a weak singularitarian, okay. excuse me, like a weak singularitarian attitude in that, you know, maybe we're not going to be uploading our consciousness into computers in the next 15 years, but we may have enough other stuff that mitigates the need for statehood or to deal with the state that people just naturally move that way. And then if there's a real assault on the state, like, again, fiat currency when you are running it on a country with this much debt turns it out not to be sustainable which is in one scenario um 
you know, it could go a lot faster. And I don't think that would be a good thing. We don't want it to be fast. We should, yeah. it should sort of be as fast as necessary, but no faster because you end up with a bunch of problems, you know, namely, you know, poor people getting screwed and, and perfectly stable cities becoming unstable and a bunch of really unpleasant effects like that. So, that brings up two questions for me. One about uh, social security in the broad sense, not the specific sense. Mm -hmm. You think that there will be programs in place that will come about where people can voluntarily help other people and keep, let's say, people who are very severely mentally ill and people who are severely mm -hmm. uh, violent, people like who takes care of the outliers? Well, there's your problem, right? So there's that, and then the other hard problem is who's going to defend your country. Yeah. Uh, and, and David Friedman freely admits that the problem of a standing army in a voluntary society is not an easy problem to solve. <laughs> uh, the, the mechanisms for that have to do with basically analogs from insurance. I think, um, what it would boil down to in a certain sense would be armed insurance forces, which is, again, something that you should look at David Friedman for because he explains it better than I do. But the, the, uh, the problem of the outliers of you know, who we need to take care of in this society uh, is a related problem in a way. You have, uh, there's an argument that's been coming from the conservatives for a very long time. And I wish I knew the provenance of that argument because it's definitely not mine and I'm not even exactly sure whether I agree with it. But the, the idea is that the very existence of welfare programs being operated by the state alleviates people to care about each other in a way that they really ought to and that hmm. there are resources around to take care of the people who need taken care of the people who can't take care of themselves for whatever reason but we have abdicated that responsibility for our fellow human beings because we know that well if nothing else the social services is going to come take care of that and that's actually a pretty bad way to run a society that's corrosive to what we call society in a political sense it, it negates um, the voluntary action and the responsibility of the, the human to human connection in a way exactly anyway that's a that's a long-standing conservative argument I think there is something to that again I am hmm. really reluctant to do what many conservatives are prepared to do and simply just end those programs because I think that would be a disaster people have constructed lives that presuppose the existence of these forms of help out there, and it would be wrong to just blow them up and walk away. I'm, I'm not a collapsitarian in that respect. Uh, but, but eventually, I think that there are resources around. We are the most generous country on Earth. And remember when the whole uh, the tsunami happened in Indonesia, the Red Cross actually had to ask the United States as a whole to please stop sending money because they didn't have anywhere to put it. There was just oh, no okay. mechanism to take these donations okay. and, and route them in a sensible manner because they were just overwhelmed with people ready to pour out their pockets for this. And so I, I think we are a good people. I think people are basically good. And I think that would win the day. That might be a naive point of view, hmm. but I think we're better off going with that assumption than the one that I've seen reflected in other forms of politics where people are sort of eternally needing some kind of educational correction or another yeah. and they can be they can be indoctrinated into some kind of state that we would like to get them into that would mm -hmm. force them to make good choices, right? The yeah. Apple argument there, which yeah. which strikes me if it's more, I hope it's not more realistic because it is quite a bit more repulsive. It, you brought up way back when, when we started talking, you brought up your modernist aesthetic and you threw out the word quality mm -hmm. and uh, you based it on intuition. I wonder if, do you have any thoughts or have you made any connections between uh, the aesthetic um, idea of quality in art and the ethical quality of mores and human relations? There is some overlap. I think if you cannot intuit a correct ethical position, you got a problem that your intellect can't solve. There's 
a lot of attention in the art world placed on the thought of Heidegger mm -hmm. and antecedents to Heidegger. Uh, the, the, anybody who's involved in some kind of theory-based art is pretty much tracing their roots back to Heidegger in some form. And I don't know Heidegger well at all, but I do know that he was an actual Nazi. All right, when you've come up with the wrong answer to the question of, would it be a good idea to kill all the Jews? Yeah. You have a problem that philosophy is not really going to help you with. I think if you if you can't intuit your way to the right answer about that, you've blown it. And to a great extent, the same thing is true about making quality judgments in art, which the consequences of blowing a quality judgment in art is obviously quite a bit less severe and, and much less important. And I don't mean to equate these things yeah, in, uh, yeah. as by, by severity by any means. But the problem that you encounter is very similar and that you kind of have to get into the situation and understand it and feel out what the right thing to do is. And hopefully you have some sense of what that is. If you are the sort of person who is inclined to just scream at people, then you know it almost doesn't matter what your philosophy is you need to kind of get in touch with all right i'm a human being and that's another human being over there and i feel something hmm. about myself that i can assume to be true about this other person and if you are such a sociopath that you can't do that then you need to start over and the whole program that gets you to a certain conclusion about these intuitive problems ends up being completely unhelpful to you oh. without that ability to make that that heart judgment and i'm indicating my heart here uh <laughs> that um that you need to be able to do in the first place i would like to think that everybody can do that i think there are quite a few people who have trained themselves out of that and i think they are busy living these kind of pinched bitter lives that i don't relate to hmm. uh, and nevertheless see quite a bit of when I watch what goes on in the name of say activism or online discussion yeah 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 I, I wonder and you make a good point about not equating the severity of bad aesthetic versus bad ethical judgments but I wonder if there isn't a overlap in how one's intuitive sense of I guess beauty and sympathy are developed and if uh, my question is do you, do you have any ideas about how one develops the process of, of appreciating beauty appreciating another person and maybe those two things are completely separate I think that they're kind of linked but I think so too I think that there's going to be found to be a biological basis for this at some point. There's been some interesting work in neuroscience around the mirror neurons. Again, I'm an artist, so don't listen to me say anything about science and, you know, let's just don't. It's wrong. Okay, let me just say in advance. <laughs> Wrong. But, there's a, but there's some interesting science that has been done around the development of these capacities. They seem to start really, really young. Like if, um, if just to take something for an example, uh, homosexuality seems to, if it's not innate, it's pretty darn close to being, uh, to, to being inborn. And it, it would, I think, surprise just about everybody if they thought that that was not almost completely in place like by the age of six, which is about the same time that people start making moral judgment as well. I think we, we've established that you can you can take a four-year-old and ask a moral question of a four-year-old and that doesn't work out so well. But when you get into age six or seven, you start to encounter something like moral reasoning. And so all of this stuff seems to develop on a really early template. And then after that, it's largely a matter of education and exposure to good ideas. And, and uh, that hopefully what you have is some ability to question yourself so that you can say, well, am I right about this? How do I know that this is true? Metacognition, right? When, yeah. and which I think is something that we could all use more of. But I'm a huge mm. fan of metacognition. And just that problem of going through and, and asking yourself, well, how do I know this is true? How do I know that I am not doing a number on myself? 
being a huge fan of this, this relates really closely to how you look at art as a modernist, as you get in front of it and say, okay, this is what I think of this. And then somebody else who you respect gets in front of the same object and comes to a completely different conclusion about it. So are you wrong? Is he wrong? You go and you look again. You try to get another impression on it, and this time you, you maybe think about what this other person is saying, or you don't think about it. Maybe you put it out of your mind. So well, let me just try to look at this thing clean again. And you might do that dozens and dozens of times, and your opinion about that may change or it may not change. And when you're talking about art, it doesn't really matter what conclusion you come to, although there does seem to be a consensus out there. It's not inviolable, but it's certainly extant. And I and think basically, basically the same process is going to be happening around moral judgments as well. I think you can start with a certain talent for moral judgment and sympathy and empathy, and you can cultivate that and you can educate that, or you can neglect it or run into weird ideas that undermine it over time. But you don't automatically jump to, well, it's all subjective, it's all taste. You don't make that shortcut. You engage repeatedly with the art and with the other people that are looking at the art. You, you have some sort of investment in, I guess, developing a relationship with the work of art. If you see at a certain early point that it has enough quality and time put into it to warrant repetitive, uh, a, a, re, a longer relationship, but you don't just give up right away. You don't give up if the thing seems worth staying with. Like, I think there's, before, you, you made a really interesting point about it not all being subjective. That is a, that's something that interests me quite a lot, and I want to get back to it. But in the meantime, I think if you went to a museum, and let, let's, I don't know the uh, I don't know the Seattle Art Museum super well, so I'm not. There's a be able to we can talk that. about the uh, Spanish guitarist in the Chicago uh, Art Institute if you know that one. Okay, is that Sergeant Velasquez? It's Picasso. Yeah, oh, it's, it's Picasso. Okay, all right, all right, I know I know that one. So you might okay. So there's here's this thing in a museum, which is an instant judgment right there, right? They think this should be on the wall and not in the trash bin out in the back of the museum, right? So there's an instant judgment right there. And then you have people kind of stopping and looking at this thing and kind of doing this and kind of doing that. And then they, they go wander off and look something else. So let's say you get in front of this thing and you hate it, right? This is, you've decided a stupid thing to do with a canvas and you don't like it at all. Maybe a perfectly valid reaction, right? So, but here, here is this museum, and here are all these people looking at this. So, are you missing something? Well, maybe you are. Maybe you need to go back and look at it, or maybe they're all idiots. Maybe you need to just cut them off because, like, you know, they're looking at this piece of garbage, and, and it's clearly not worth anything. So, then you need to feel out your own inclination for, okay, is this something I'm going to get into? Is this something I'm going to try? I mean, should I go look at more Picasso? Should I go look at more paintings of guys playing musical instruments? Should I just go wander around the museum? Should, do I need to get something to drink? You know, what is it? What, what's going on here? So over the process of a lot of time, which any relationship was going to take a lot of your time, you start to hash out, okay, this is something I really don't care for, but it's good, or this is something that I like a lot that isn't good, or maybe it all lines up, I like it and it's good, or I don't like it and it's not good. And you start to go back and forth between your own reaction and the object itself and form a feeling about it that is a mature feeling rather than an insta mm. feeling. Okay, Which yeah. you might, and the, you know, the insta feeling might be right. You might nail it. And uh, good art critics will get into art really quickly and really convincingly in a short amount of time because they have done thousands and upon thousands of hours of looking. And they can just kind of get to where they're at faster. They are fooled by fewer trappings about the art. They are uh, less impressed by things like technical bravado because they've seen a lot of that. So, you know, we who do this quite a bit, supposedly... Uh, are pretty good at it and, and there is a skill element to this like I was saying um, there are also a lot of people who are working art critics who I would not pick out a pair of socks for me so 
again, there also seems to be an element of talent that you can't do anything about if you're yeah. missing it from the get-go. You, you brought up the uh, what you were just saying now about the, a mature feeling, having, uh, fostering a mature feeling, and you know, you, some people have experience at getting to that sooner. That complicates the idea of intuition. Usually people think of intuition as a flash, as just that immediate reaction. But you are saying you're not decoupling yourself from uh, from thought, from the process of thought and the process of struggle. But you brought up earlier that intuition is still a cornerstone in the relationship. That's absolutely right. And it continues to be intuitive, even though it's a mature kind of intuition. And there's a real easy analog for this. If you think about the first feelings that you had for the your first crush, right that's that hormone driven obsession about some pretty superficial qualities regarding a person that ultimately you didn't really know that well this is like a universal experience in love right those early relationships are just sort of caricatures of what love is like and then hopefully by the time you have been through some relationships and gained more insights into life you still have a feeling driven experience right that the person that you're with now is uh, you know satisfies you on on different levels and hopefully brings some wisdom to your relationship and a sense of peace and understanding and other good things like that it completely unlike that stupid crush that you had way back when but it's still it's still intuition right I can't, I can't explain to you why my girlfriend's nose is the most beautiful thing on earth, right? That's not something I can prove to you, and you might disagree with it, and I'm not going to care, right? This is all absolutely as personal as could be, but hmm. at the same time, there's an aspect of it that um, that I hope reflects the fact that I'm an adult and not a teenager anymore in in that relationship. And, yeah. you know, hopefully the, the judgments that I bring to art reflect the fact that I've been looking at art for decades rather than weeks yeah and i wonder if that's the, a I had the question uh, that i'm sorry to interrupt you there i've had the question that was basically I've, I've done some teaching and i've done some speaking and i've gotten the question in a couple of different forms that basically boils down to you know who cares about your opinion right well, what gives you know you're an art critic what gives you the right to say something about this piece of art that isn't just as good as anything else out there and um there, there's a glib answer to that that basically goes, well, I'm one of the few people around who can tell you exactly what his word is worth. And the answer is like 10 cents to a dollar a word, depending on who's paying. Huh. <laughs> Which doesn't well, you're sound talking... like much, but it's more than most other people around. We're not getting paid anything for their opinions about art. So that's the glib answer. And then the real answer is that I have practice. I have a lot of practice looking at art. So I started with some ability to see art, and I exercised that ability and did a lot of reading and did a lot of looking and asked myself, why, you know, why is this puddle of mush over here on this rectangle a really great puddle of mush and then why is that puddle of mush over on that rectangle not as good which is uh, you know which is an interesting problem and once after doing that several thousands of times i hope i have an interesting take on uh, on the problem what are you about to ask me though uh i was going to use what you're talking about about relationships and how even mm -hmm. though they're still emotively um there's still that emotional fuel or that intuitive outreach going on between two people. Over time, it becomes more mature. And I wonder if that's mm -hmm. a way to get back to what um, subjectivity is and not uh, making subjectivity yeah. something that's actually very important. Yes, it is all subjective, but that's because we're all unique beings or, or something like that. It, uh, if that, that subjectivity goes back to what it is to be a human. Yeah, so you've touched on a really hard problem, and I think the issue with its hardness, with the difficulty of answering that, is that subjective and objective are not really reflective of what is actually going on. Uh, so Clement Greenberg wrote a fair amount of material about the objectivity of taste. Hmm. 
so this is this is another way of of saying this because subjective isn't the right word. He's going with with objective, and the reason he prefers objective and objectivity of taste is uh, is to solve the harder problem of a two part problem. And I'll and I'll get to um, and let me explain that. So basically, if if taste were completely objective in the sense that we normally mean objective, like, you know, I'm holding this pen and this pen is a certain hardness and all, this is all stuff that we can agree on is an objective property of the pen. If taste is like that, hmm. then it should never vary. Yeah. Right? If there shouldn't be that much difference in taste between people because, you know, there's, there's something objectively good about this as an art object. And if there is difference of opinion about this, then something is wrong with somebody's eyesight or their cognition or something really innate like that that is actually kind of a horrible thing to assume. Like, I'm right about this being a good art object, and if you can't see that, you are factually wrong and effective, right? So that, that's not acceptable, right? We, we don't go through the aesthetic experience like that. That's, that's terrible. Now, if... You assume that taste is subjective in the way that we normally use the word subjective, and that it's all completely personal, then there's no explanation for the consensus, right? Why, why would anybody agree on anything? Why would you, why would we kind of generally accept that Rembrandt's a good painter just to pick somebody? Maybe you don't like Rembrandt, but there's a lot of agreement that Rembrandt's a decent painter. So this, this consensus exists, and there's no way to explain that consensus if taste is completely subjective. Well, there is. Unless unless taste is a giant conspiracy theory. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there's that. But that's also a terrible thing to go around assuming, right? That the only reason that anybody has any taste is because there's this, you know, ch choose whatever boogeyman you want, either capitalism or education or, or the patriarchy. Just, you know, just pick whatever demon you like, <laughs> and that's the real source of taste. Like, there's no exercise of taste outside of this conspiracy theory that – that just drives people to have similar opinions about things. It's all it's all cowardice and lack of judgment. So that's awful too. So we have this two sided, awful problem, which means that probably we're not thinking about it in the right way. And I tried to coin the term panjective at one point to try to get around going with either subjective or objective about this. There's, there, I think, is some kind of reaction. Like, the reality, the objective reality is that there is this interchange or interplay between our senses and the art object. Like, that's the real part of it, that this is going on. And the way that we experience that is personal. It's objective in Greenberg's sense, not like in the in like the dictionary definition of objective on some, although it probably is too, but it's objective in Greenberg sense anyway, in that it's a real process that's really going on between your innate experience and this tangible art object that you're looking at. So we don't, so the, the experience is personal, hence subjective, but since we don't really differ from each other all that much, that's how the consensus forms. Whatever is the real and constant quality between human beings and the fact that you know we all laugh and we all fall in love, or at least you know most of us anyway, uh, there are, there's enough commonality between people that are reactions to art are not really all that different. They vary in the details, but they don't really differ that much on the broad outline, and that's how the consensus forms. So we can talk about taste being objective in that sense. Now, I don't experience it as a real thing, because people who I respect and admire dislike the art that I like, and I don't like some of the art that they look at, but that ends up mattering less than the overall activity, like the overall gist of the activity itself. Okay. And that's and my explanation for that. And as a critic, you do you see yourself inserting your opinion between into that experience? You're, you're, you have the, the possibility that you're creating a film or a lens or a, a layer that blocks that relationship, or rather than blocks, makes it more conductive. So what I'm doing as a critic is demonstrating in public the intelligent exercise of taste. 
my reasons for doing that are not so that you will agree with me because I don't care. Huh. But the reason I'm doing it is so you can see what the public exercise of taste looks like and try it on your own. Arrive at your own judgment via the means that I arrived at it, at mine, by looking at a thing and reflecting on a thing and looking at it again and comparing it to other things that I've seen. And that's not for you to copy, it's for you to emulate in broad outline, not in the specifics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm not I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'm here to tell you what I think as an art yeah. critic. Yeah, it's and a performative thing to the side. We can call there. it that. We can call it a performative thing. Now, hopefully, I say something and it's insightful enough because we have things in common with one another. Where you might say, "Oh yeah, you know, that's I've never thought of it that way," or that vague feeling that I had about this object. He put that into words really well. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, there's a literary component to this, of course, and I'm hoping to do that well and do that artfully and do that in a way that's convincing. But I can't prove anything to you about it, and I, yeah. wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't know how to go about that if I was challenged to. It's like, well, this is just my experience. I, I hope you find that experience interesting, and I hope that informs your own experience. Now go out and look at some art. Yeah, but when you go from... So when you critic... When you practice practice the act of publicly engaging with a work of art. Uh, you're not, I'm going to sum up what you said. You're not really trying to convince anybody else of your position. You're just demonstrating the act of expression or reaction. Well, let me put it this way. I'm, I am trying to convince you of something, but I'm not trying to prove it to you, which is a different activity. Hmm. I can't prove to you that a good work of art is good. I can't do it, but I can relay what my experience is in a literary and and uh, in literarily truthful way, and hope that you can catch the bug. Okay. So you can see me get into art and be excited about it and go along with that, or you know, or disagree with it. Like, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. There's certainly that experience, or just say, you know, I, I looked at this and I had a problem with it, and this was my problem. Uh, and do that in a way that is sufficiently interesting that it's not just, oh, let's see what kind of response Franklin had today, because that's not really what it's about either. It's about the broader exercise of saying, well, this guy's exercising his taste. I will exercise mine along with him, and let's go have this adventure together. Okay. And when you, but when you step from art in America into the Federalist, the mm -hmm. stakes are different. The stakes could yes. be said to be much higher when you're talking about free speech rather than talking about a specific act of free speech, which would be art. How right. does the pressure of the stakes being raised change your stance, change your position, change what you're trying to do in that medium? Are you still trying to convince people rather than prove people? Or do you still try to keep a aesthetic detachment? Okay, uh, that's a complicated question that's going to have a complicated answer. This is something that I have uh, had discussions with with someone who you know as Japanese American in Boston. Yeah. I know her. Yes, okay. I, I don't know if she wants to be included in this today, so I'm, I'm going to just make an opening <laughs> reference and then you can do with that what you want. Uh, her name's Keiko! Yes, yeah, Keiko. Hi, Keiko. <laughs> so, uh, Keiko has chided me, and I think rightfully, about the some of the things that I have written in The Federalist that I very much aim at Federalist readers for their entertainment. Okay. I am perfectly willing to admit that I am not really in the act of persuasion when I do, as I did in my most recent Federalist piece, refer to a fellow writer uh, likening to him to a herpes lesion. On the that, on the lips of was, public discourse or something. <laughs> yes, yes. I was not elevating the discourse. I was lowering the discourse. It was rude, and uh, and I accomplished nothing by that except the amusement of Federalist readers. Yeah. Now I am perfectly happy to mm. entertain the readers of the Federalist. That is something that I think I'm brought on to do. They don't want dry analysis. This is not this is not a um, a public policy journal. This is a daily hot take okay uh 
right-leaning news site. Yeah. And they want to see some people get smacked around, and I know how to do that. And this comes from many, many years of blogging, in huh. which I realized that I was kind of good at that format. And if, uh, and and as I put it to a few people in other conversations, I have a black belt in hurting people's feelings on the <laughs> internet. I'm really good at it. If you come I, at me, you're going down. Okay. And I will not cross you. I'll try not to. You just better not, Ben. It's not going to work out well for you. But the conclusion that I came to after several years of doing that was that I wasn't changing any minds. Oh. And the interesting problem, or at least the problem that became interesting to me after a while, was how do I encounter somebody who I'm disagreeing with and change their mind. Yeah. So this this turns out to be a much more difficult thing to get a black belt in than hurting people's feelings on the internet, which I'm already really good at. So that became the next problem to solve. Okay. Now, like I said, I throw out some things at the Federalists that I uh, that I freely admit are not persuasive, but amuse my readers. And if I can amuse my readers, I can draw them into a more nuanced argument. And I do that deliberately sometimes. I, I do try to hit clean. I think I've had opportunities to just go completely below the belt on some topics, and the Federalists would have published it, but I would have not felt good about myself the next day. Yeah. And, uh, and I've actually done edits with another publication where... The editor, this was another right-leaning publication where the editor changed something that I had written to make a reference to the humorless left. And I pushed back really hard on that edit. I said, I don't want to make any broad generalizations about the left because I am aiming this at someone who thinks of himself as liberal and maybe left who is among the persuadable and I want to persuade him and I will not do that if I insult him and his. Right. So there's no that that serves no good purpose. Now Keiko is much better at keeping that mind than I am. And I I defer to her she's basically a a better person. But let's just get down to it. Uh, <laughs> that said, the um, the problem remains interesting to me of how do I go in there and get that mind changed? You know, not, not the crazy people because you can't do anything about crazy, but somebody who is wondering about stuff and asking himself, how do I know this to be true that I think? I want to be able to reach that person and bring him or her into something a little bit more into a view that is amenable to my own. So that's very much an act of proof in a way that our criticism is not. Yeah. I can possibly prove that free speech is a good thing. And I am prepared to pro I'm prepared to prove that free speech is a far better thing than a lot peop than many people are prepared to uh, venture into. I didn't say that very well at all, but I have gone into arguments to the effect of hate speech is a net good because yeah the effort that we would have to go through in order to stop hate speech, to obliterate hate speech, would be fascistic and would be utterly totalitarian and it would have far more downsides than it would upsides. I'd be happy to see prejudice disappear as much as anyone, but I'm not prepared to engage in any means whatsoever to do it. Hmm. Well, there, that's not true though. I'm sure you would call somebody out if they're being hateful. I, mean, I would happily call somebody out if they're hateful. I would not point a gun at them. Okay. Yeah. Or I, have or have would, the Gestapo not, come in. I would not rock them, right? I would. There are a lot of things that I'm not prepared to do to stop hate speech that that I think are beyond the pale. I would I would rather suffer this idiotic hate speech than go through certain measures in order to stop it. So, and I'm prepared to set that marker quite a bit into. Um, it may be at a farther point than many people are prepared to do. So 
Uh, but more, more to your question, the thing that changes going from criticism to political commentary is that there is an opportunity for proof at that point. There is an opportunity for reasoned argument. I can't really make a reasoned argument talking about why this piece of art is good or that piece of art is good, but I can sound reasonable, which is a little bit of a different thing, right? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. can, I can sound like an informed human being who has some interesting insights into this topic, yeah. whereas I can actually use reason in a political argument. And we should be using reason to the greatest extent that we can. Okay. Um, admitting that story is really just as effective as logic, and probably more so when it comes to persuasion. Uh, nevertheless, I think that story needs to adhere to a certain attitude about realism that we want yes. to be truthful and factual, and we want to appeal to something greater than anyone's individual reaction. And if I just get, if I, if I do a thing because I feel it to be the right thing to do, that will be good if my feelings are correct, if my feelings are deranged, if my feelings have been yanked out of proportion, then I may very well do the wrong thing. That's where we get road rage. You know, road rage has a very solid basis in emotive reasoning, right? It's like, well, that guy made me angry, so I hit him. Like that, okay, well... That may be justified on some level, but that's not where we want to be as human beings, right? We want to have a more complete, fleshed out emotional basis for what we're doing here. And part of that is an aspiration to say, well, we want to be truthful and we want to be good and we want to be, uh, we want to be in the right with with uh, ethics and other things that are very hard to define and we basically go back to an emotional basis for it but there's that that movement between our the best of our emotions and our best thinking mm -hmm. and and away from our worst emotions and our worst thinking yeah is do you see art as possibly uh one of the ways for people to keep their emotions healthy and keep keep themselves uh ordered on an emotional level no it's useless for that no okay and, and not even the make i guess the, the, the making of it then no the, the the people who made art occasionally are complete bastards and have no idea what they're doing uh there are uh, a lot of it, I mean, the classic examples of the people who were listening to classical music while the uh, gas chambers operating down the road were going in full effect um, I, I don't okay. know if that's okay. like an apocryphal okay. story or a real one, but there's a certain truth about it. Okay. Okay. Um, so I, you're, you've touched on something that I think is important to think about in terms of the utilitarian aspect of art, right? Well, will art make us better people? I don't think it will. I think using it that way is actually a source of a lot of the, hmm. um, the bad art. The bad art is sort of deliberately didactic. Okay, the bad yeah. art is trying to get you to care about this issue, whatever the issue is. Yeah. The bad art is trying to teach you a lesson. And the good art might teach mm. you a lesson. The good art might show you a better way to be. But the fact of the matter is that the good art is sort of operating in its own way for its own reasons, for its own existence. And if and it's not and anything else that happens in addition to that is largely a byproduct. The art is kind of self extant. The good art is satisfyingly self extant. Yeah. And if you've ever seen, say, a good abstract painting, that makes that clear. Like there's nothing really being imposed theoretically or intellectually by that painting beyond a couple of basics about what the object is yeah. but you can be missing all that and get in front of a work of abstract art and if you have a feel for it you can say well this is good i'm enjoying this so art's useless yeah it, it doesn't make any sense it has no reasonable content it doesn't help you be a better person no. so your question, I can tell, is why are we bothering, right? No, it, it's not my question, but somebody's okay. question might be. Okay. So in, the, in answer to that somebody, the reason we're bothering is because this is the highest work of civilization. The reason we have civilization <laughs> is so we can engage in this useless pleasure. Yeah, okay. Where it's, it's not tied to our survival, and it's not tied to anything important that... Uh, 
it, it, important in the practical sense. It's important in an impractical sense, and that's a thing. Mm -hmm. We are going through all this work to solve the problems of the world and accumulate capital so we can hang around and argue about what's the better arc of Star Trek yeah. and why is this painting better than that painting and should we go to the local Indian place or the local Thai place. Like, this is the highest work of civilization. It's not the most important work of civilization, it's the highest. Okay, yeah, or s stuffing a bunch of gunpowder into tubes and seeing what colors we can make in the sky. Yeah, that's awesome. That is a fabulous, fabulous application of gunpowder. The use of gunpowder where we gotta like kill a guy because he's become too big of a problem, that's really unfortunate. When we have to do that instead of just making <laughs> cool colors and big noises, we're, we're not in the, our optimal state of humanity at that point. Yeah. You, uh, to go way back again, you brought up uh, the, you were qualifying what you mean by a modernist take on art. And I saw, I felt that I saw or heard an analog with liberalism in the classical sense, where you are fostering a position within art that you can go and have discussions and engage with a whole bunch of different viewpoints or genres. Mm -hmm. You you, uh, you exist between. Is that fair? Is that what makes it modern? Ooh, okay, that's a good question. Let me think about that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to go with you on that. I think that's the essential development of modernity was let's see if we can solve these problems that we have with each other without drawing swords. That's... Hmm. So this becomes a really complicated thing because a lot of woe has been rightly laid at the feet of modernity. Um, there have been solid arguments against scientific approaches to certain problems that have not panned out very well in the social sphere. Yeah. Um, we could call that a modern phenomenon as well, as opposed to Hmm. Well, in broad outline, we could look at it this way, that we might, we might have a society that's basically ordered around religious principles. Yeah. So, we're all going to be Catholic here, and yeah. just fix something. And there's a Catholic way of doing things, and anything that's not the Catholic way of doing things is bad, and we're going to punish that, and throw people in jail or kill them if necessary, if it goes really non-Catholic. So, well, that's a very non-modern way of looking at, uh, at, at constructing a society, right? Yeah, yeah. So, the more modern way is to go with the Enlightenment principles and say, well, all right, no, let's not do that. Let's, let's come up with a couple of basic secular mores that we're going to orient around, like we're going to try and solve our problems with killing each other, we are going to have a system of laws that we will appeal to rather than just appeal to whatever feelings of whatever individual magistrate is going to issue a judgment. So there's going to be a body of law consequently. So you know, this is all modern stuff, and it's one of those things that works until it doesn't, right? Yeah. Because even... You know, the laws start throwing minorities in jail in, a, in disproportionate numbers. The, um, the loss of that religious basis causes people to be ethically unmoored and spiritually unsatisfied. And families start to break up because there is no Catholic Church forcing everybody to be yeah. together in, in a way that they, they were in times past. So, you know, this is all modern stuff, too. And the, uh, the scientific mindset, which I think in abstract work we tend to be in favor of, right? Because science is awesome and um, it does all these great things. And I can talk to you. You're on the opposite coast from me. We can have a real-time conversation and record it. And you know, all this stuff is great. At the same time, that is the basis for the worst disasters of socialism and fascism. That scientific mindset applied to humanity, the engineering mindset applied to humanity. Yeah. Uh, so that is also unfortunately a modern phenomenon and a, a phenomenon of modernism. And the, the one thing about which um, 
you can say in favor of postmodernism in as many, many incarnations and whatever that means to people is that it was an attempt to solve a real problem and that modernity really ended up a disaster in a lot of respects. Uh, th there's a lot to critique about it too. Uh, this ends up, and Johann Hari pointed this out, that the pre-modern and the post-modern are natural allies, allies which is how um, Foucault ends up being a, an admirer of the Ayatollah Khomeini, as he was, at least in his writings. And um, a lot of woe falls out of that similarity of thinking style. You know, we're just going to do this because we believe it. Yeah. Well, okay, that that's maybe not modern enough. Okay, yeah. Maybe we need to bring back a little bit of modernism. The 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 bare fact of the matter is that there's no system out there that's so great that nobody can apply it badly. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's just the nature of systems, and everything has to be a continual act of one renegotiation and to some kind of effort to seek out the objectively true and the independently true and lacking the objectively true, right? Something something that is a reality that continues to persist even after I go away, right? Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't work to live in the solipsistic universe. I have to accept, okay, there's a reality out here that really doesn't care for the likes of me, perhaps. And I have to make some kind of appeal to that reality. And at the same time, I can't just say, well, this is the way it is. I'm only going to do this thing. You believe firmly, like we talked about in the beginning, about a kind of a truly postmodern or like the next the statelessness and, and uh, some sort of weird opt in uh, moray. Um, a system that where the money is offloaded and the defense is offloaded onto these um, computer, probably computer engineered, uh, you know, distribution things. Uh, and so it'll be it'd be interesting. I don't know if we have time to talk about that, but you still said that that you're a modernist when it comes to engaging with with art. And and I heard the there there was this. There was this place that you carved out that allows you to interact with all these other systems. And I wonder, this is the question, I wonder, when you go back into the act of creation, uh, do, you, do you forget all that? Do you, or do, do you end up floating around from one style to another? Or do you have one style that you're burrowing into and developing uh, one, one genre? Or? Yeah, we're talking about my work as an artist then. Yeah. I just go with whatever is grabbing my attention. I'd be as unprogrammatic about it as I can. Yeah. And I've attempted to make political art. Uh, usually it doesn't go very well for me. And I started Wait, to get the, the art with, itself or the, the yeah, reaction? Where the art itself has some kind of political content to it. And if you go to my site, you won't see any of it because I don't think any of it is strong enough to be there. Yes, I think it perhaps could go there if I could continue to push on it. But it's raw, and I am, at least in that respect, a bit of a conservative, that I am perfectly content to not let that come into my work. You know, this is, uh, this is something that's been discussed a little bit on the right, and being who I am, I'm privy to discussion, that why, why is there so little Republican art? Mm -hmm. And... When Republican art gets made, why is so hmm. uh, And it tends to be. It, it tends to be like a really weak kind of figuration, like realism with a patriotic message. And a lot of it just doesn't function very well as art. It was okay as illustration, but it just doesn't work well as art. Okay, yeah. And... When it comes up, you, you have to sort of look at a mindset where if you're aesthetically conservative, which is not to be politically conservative, it's a different thing, but if you're aesthetically conservative, you tend to look at experience, art experiences that have political content and start to just get put off by it. And just say, well, you know, this is not really the kind of thing that I like. And that is true whether that content is either right-leaning or left-leaning. And 
the attempt to deal with that has been really unsuccessful on the part of the Republicans. There's not really like a lot of great Republican art out there. Hmm. Uh, well, it, is there it, a great Democrat art? Or is there just great art that's produced by people who end up voting Democrat? It's probably mostly the latter. But I wouldn't say Democrat art more as leftist art. I mean, there's certainly been loads of leftist art. And most of it is also quite bad. It's not as bad as the right. right-leaning art for the most part. Yeah. Um, I can think of some exceptions. Um, you could you could say that certain David Mamet plays have, uh, have conservative underpinnings and they're quite good as art. So it can be done. Of course, playwriting is a very language-driven medium and well, it's a patently language-driven medium. And language is the vehicle of politics. If you try to do politics visually, it's usually terrible. It's usually really flat and completely uninteresting and preaching to the choir. And the exceptions yeah. to that are the people for whom politics was somehow artistically enabling. You think of somebody like Keita Kolvich okay. or um, the Taller de Grafico Popular or like guys who really latched on to something that made them feel a thing, and then the art is about that feeling rather mm. than being directly about the political sentiment, which is usually just kills the whole thing. You yeah, can look yeah. at a bunch of artists who tried a political piece like a Manet or Picasso, and it's not good. Yeah. It's like you would rather have just about anything else that they painted over that. Yeah, it seems like even though art is the highest function of civilization, like you were saying, um, not that I believe that to anybody who's going to jump on me for saying that, but even though art is the highest thing that a civilization can create, once that art is about the civilization or the polis, or once it starts removing itself from that individual experience or tries to imprint something onto that individual, which is what politics is, is some sort of uh, some sort of agreement. Um, it it loses its uh, its uh, self extantness, like you were you were talking about. It it grounds itself in the wrong way, or it interjects it, it interjects a whole set a whole nest of spidery passions and concerns and fears that that are reduced from that electric aesthetic experience by, by by stapling them to meaning somehow i'm i'm kind of you know speaking stupidly because i'm kind of reaching yeah, for i think you here. actually got that right i think that is first of all you can't say a priori that if you make political art it's going to be bad art because that's not true uh mm -hmm. the question is is this political sentiment going to enable the art which is a different kind of question and the answer is going to be completely individual. There are going to be people who can do something with that and people who can't do anything with that. I am one of the people who can't do anything with it. And there are also people uh, who can do something really effective with it. I'm thinking of a guy named uh, Warren Craghead, who has been doing a Trump drawing every day since he started campaigning. Huh. And they are intensely disturbing and uh and quite effective so he's been enabled and there are people around who have been similarly enabled there are also just some people who have been inspired unfortunately they they were prompted to do a thing and they ended up making a lousy piece of anti-trump art uh, and there's quite a bit more of those people than there are of my friend warren yeah uh, well that's and true that's, about everything though but exactly that's that's just what i was going to say that's true about anything you can you know there are thousands upon thousands of paintings of crucifixions and some of them are delacroix and and others of them are somebody you ain't never heard of and you shouldn't hear of them because they're no good yeah that 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 woman who yeah. painted the jesus of i can't remember though yeah i know the one you mean the uh, the yeah. spanish art restorer who <laughs> who rather badly updated a uh the Christ. Yeah, a fresco <laughs> with, with her elbow. I think she was using her elbow. <laughs> I didn't know that part. <laughs> no, no, she probably was. She was probably a devout Christian who was trying her utmost to do right by that painting. As Oscar Wilde yeah. said, all bad art is sincere. Yeah, exactly. Huh. Yeah. Is there witty art? Oh, sure. Or, well, okay, that's a stupid question, but do you find... I don't even know where the question is, but 
What what is it about the weight of our? I I never mind. Forget about that. That's a stupid question. <laughs> let me, let me, I can save that question, Ben. I got you. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull that question back into a productive place. So there is there is definitely wit in art, and there are some people who are verbal wits, and there are some people who are witty visually, and that is a that is a particular each of those is a particular kind of talent. I think. Uh, in really intellectual art, such as Magritte, there's definitely an element of wit. Or the, the surrealists, I think, uh, are trying to summon wit in a in a in a particular way. And uh, you know that that relates closely to talent. You can talk about visual wit, but it's more or less analogous to any other kind of visual talent. Like you know, those those shapes come together very well in that particular way, and that was uh, that was a good thing to see by whatever powers. Yeah. That uh, that artist had the uh, had the ability to see it with, you, uh, and then certainly in the literary arts, there's a, a great need for wit because, as uh, as I can tell you as a writer, you need to get to your damn point and you need to do it in a way that feels like the prose is moving forward. Yeah. And if you don't sustain that, you don't sustain the reader's interest, and you're asking them to undergo a trial on behalf of your art that is a is a big thing to ask for their yeah. patience and their time they don't have anything else except their time and here you are making unreasonable demands upon it so yeah so yeah that's that's a needed thing for sure to sustain attention yeah and to deserve attention yeah to that's deserve attention yeah and then eventually to manipulate attention in the way that you want it to go mm-hmm or even just to produce something that you know is an experience for you, that your commonality with other human beings will make it possible for them to enjoy in their way. It doesn't yeah. need to necessarily be your way. It can just be a way. And we can sort of rest in basic humanity to, uh, to assure us that something about those various experiences will have a common thread to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and and dissolve uh, or either dissolve that subjectivity objectivity problem or use it as a rack to to stretch our guts to the breaking point. <laughs> I like it. I'm going to try that in my next piece. <laughs> See if we can. Do you have some more articles coming up soon, or a show, perhaps? Let's see, um, actually, the uh, the big news in my life these days as an artist is I'm going to be doing a residency. Uh, this is uh, something that takes place at the highest point in Massachusetts at Mount Greylock. Hmm. There's a there's a facility up there that's a lodge, and one of the people who runs the lodge is an artist, and that artist runs a little bit of a residency program. So I'm going to be going out there for five days to make comics poetry. Oh yeah, uh, I saw that. Yeah, so comics poetry. It is also going to be the concern that I'm going to be working on when I do my Fulbright next spring. I'm going to be going to Vienna to do comics poetry about Vienna. Huh. And the, it's called Regarding That. And the work is going to be posted at guardingth.at. Guarding with a, a U? Uh, no, regarding is R E G A R D I N G T H dot A T. Guarding. Regarding or guarding? Regarding that. Regarding. Yeah. All right. I'm going to put that. I'm going to link that. And that's not live yet? That stuff. There's a placeholder up that gives okay, you something yeah, yeah. interesting to look at if you'd like to check it out. But it's going to launch in April of 2019. Okay. And, uh,. I will be having some articles come out soon, I think. Uh, I got a few things in the hopper, but I don't want to spoil the surprise. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's, there's been some discussion that uh, in my copious free time um, <laughs> that, that I ought to start a political book as I have learned as much as I have from my art blog huh. that I might – and I – there, there is a crypto anarchist view out there, voiced here and there, usually quite poorly and unconvincingly, and with very little understanding of some basic ideas like why freedom is good, yeah, and why individualism is good, which is a hard discussion. 
but and there are people out there that can do it, but they're not bringing it to the crypto anarchism forum. So I might have to make that forum. Uh, well, we we can have another discussion about that off the air if you want to bounce. Can ideas I ask you that. by crypto anarchist? You're not talking about cryptocurrency plus anarchy, or are you talking about the way that people say crypto fascist, where you're kind of pretending to not be an anarchist? So if you go to Wikipedia. It talks about this exact thing. the The idea is that it's crypto, uh, not exclusively about cryptocurrency, but about cryptography in general. Huh. The okay. idea is that if I can communicate with you and you can communicate with me and we can come to some kind of agreement without anybody else knowing about it, that is the basis for the stateless society right there. Okay. That if if there is no way for that to be regulated, because we have cryptography. That is a uh, that is first and foremost a speech issue, before it is a contract issue, and the money part of that is a byproduct of the contracting, which is a byproduct huh. of the speech. So there is an order that falls out of that, and so we're talking crypto as in cryptography, not as in I'm pretending to do this thing. Yeah, I'm okay. pretending to be something else. <laughs> So you're but right out there said, with it. The guy who coined this dumb term is did that on purpose. He knew that the crypto fascist reference was out there and decided just to say, well, I'm going to I'm going to do this because I know what it means. And if you don't get it, then too bad for you. And this is it's, this attitude has caused more trouble for the libertarian movements of various kinds than anything else. Oh, really? <laughs> It's very cryptic, it's, I'll give them that. It's cryptic, right? So they did do that. At least they were true to form in a way. Uh, again, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, and this actually is an argument for not going by this term. The reason I do it is because it's deliberately confusing, uh, mostly yeah. because I don't want to get into a, a discussion about how I'm a bad person in various ways because I don't share certain yeah. progressive viewpoints. Um, I actually tend to share them in goals, just not in means. I I okay. want to live in a fair society where people are treated equally, no matter, matter who they are or what they do and who they do it with. with. Uh, I'm very much in favor of all that. I'm not necessarily in favor of hitting people in order to get that to happen. I'm not in favor of throwing people in jail to get that happen. I'm not in favor of threatening them to get that happen. I want it to be voluntary and based in persuasion and shared humanity. Yeah, and humor. So, and, and humor, if at all possible. I would like to have humor and love involved. I'm going to chop that off right there, just because it makes you look like a hippie by ending it on... <laughs> <laughs> You have a little uh, cheap gleam going on. Let's try a little lighting. And that's just dark. Yes. No, no. Oh, it is can you live with that there? That's fine. Dark uh, dark I don't know how how much you can see. Can you see that? Yeah, I can see it. I don't know how aesthetically discontent you are, but this. Yeah. This is what I get for trying to interview yeah. a visual artist. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're, you're stuck now. My stylist took the day off, so what do you do? Yeah, I love it. It's great.